Hi, I'm Kelsey Malloy, and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate studying climate dynamics and climate forecasting at the University of Miami Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. In this installment of Seas by Degrees, we are going to be opening a climate scientist toolbox, learning what a climate model is and how it is used for understanding past, present, and yes, even future climate. You may have heard that burning greenhouse gases in our atmosphere can lead to an increase in the average temperature of the globe. You may have seen images or videos of the projected warming temperature or other direct impacts like melting ice sheets and sea level rise going out to the year 2100. But how does anyone know the future like that? Well, scientists use climate models. A climate model or general circulation model is built on a computer with lines and lines of code that solve equations. Let's pretend we want to understand the atmosphere first. We have to break up the atmosphere into cubes. We can assign values of variables like temperature, wind, and humidity to each cube, typically based on real observations that we get from satellites, weather balloons, airplanes, etc. Now, if we were to move forward in time, each of the cube's temperature, wind, humidity will change based on solving complex equations that represent the movement of fluids, energy conservation, chemical reactions, whatever it may be. If we keep going forward in time, that becomes a simulation, a representation of how the atmosphere behaves. Our simulation is only as clear as the size of our cubes. This is called resolution. Higher resolution means smaller cubes, and lower resolution means larger cubes. Think of how an image looks on your screen now. If you switch this video to a lower resolution, like 144p on YouTube, the video will get blurrier. Same idea for climate modeling. Now at this point, we only talked about the atmosphere, but climate models also have cubes that represent the ocean, the land, ice, the entire Earth system. There are rules and equations that dictate how the different components of the model talk to each other. For example, the atmosphere talks to the ocean through a transfer of heat or carbon, or the land talks to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration of plants. Imagine stepping forward in time 100 years, solving for every single cube for every single component. This is a lot for a computer, which is why many scientists run their simulations on supercomputers, which can better handle all that math and data. All right, so how do we know if a climate model is good enough? We can hindcast. We already have records of weather and climate over the last century. So we can begin a simulation in the past, let's say 1900, and run the model until it reaches present day. Then we can compare the model's results to observations. While the details are not exactly perfect, Many of the models we use today generally simulate what has happened in the past. In addition to hindcasting, we have a whole collection of models created across the world. These models differ slightly in regards to the equations and scenarios, their resolution, or how many components they have, so we can compare them against each other to understand different processes and sensitivities. With our collection of models that do well with the hindcasting, we can try to predict the future. Scientists must consider different scenarios of human-caused climate forcings, like greenhouse gas concentrations. These are called representative concentration pathways, which are based on socioeconomic assumptions or predictions, giving us the range of possible trajectories of how we will emit carbon by the end of the century. If our consumption of fossil fuels peaked in 2020, the climate system will respond differently than if we continued on our current trajectory of burning more and more fossil fuels throughout this century. Finally, climate models aren't perfect, but they aren't meant to be. Scientists look at climate simulations as a range of possibilities. You can't look at model results as the definite state of the climate as you would expect when you open a weather app to see the high temperature for today. Instead, with our abundance of data from our various models, 
we can maybe come up with a probability or likelihood that certain events will occur. If simulations generally agree between the models, scientists will be more confident about that particular climate response. For example, all models and scenarios predict an increase in global sea levels by 2100. So we consider sea level rise a very likely outcome. Climate models are important because we can shape our world better by knowing what's in store. We can invest in green infrastructure to avoid the negative scenarios of burning fossil fuels far into the century. We can protect ecosystems that are predicted to be adversely affected. We can plan for water shortages, increased wildfire intensity, or rising sea levels. Here at the Rosenstiel School, we have scientists that take advantage of climate models to study how the climate varies now and or how the atmosphere, ocean, land, or even society will respond in the future. If you're interested in this topic, there are many resources online, including those shown on the screen. Thanks for listening to this installment of Seas by Degrees. See ya!